But what I just want to start out is just actually reminding us all how much there is a strong connection between what we know about health in wildlife, and particularly aquatic animals, uh, as much as for humans. So the uh, sea urchin, the fish, and indeed if it was on there, the squid, would all have been organisms that people have got Nobel Prizes in medicine or physiology for cancer research, for genetics, etc. Um, so when I was working in AstraZeneca, we were looking at using small fish embryos as alternatives to rats and dogs for, de for developing drugs for epilepsy. So fundamental to this uh, talk is the fact that we use um, aquatic organisms, we use invertebrates and other esoteric species for understanding aspects of health and medicine. The other side of that is when we see impacts or we see evidence in the environment of chemicals, including medicines affecting wildlife, that's telling us qualitatively something that we should be aware of. And I'm going to illustrate that by the fact about the feminization of fish in UK rivers. So obviously fish produce eggs, but if they were, um, if they were not producing eggs, this would be the equivalent of male fish lactating. So I became aware of this from watching Horizon in 1993, and basically a lot of my career was spent working with colleagues at Brunel University in UK government and elsewhere, and Exeter University, looking at what was actually in our rivers that was feminizing fish. And it's pharmaceuticals, the synthetic contraceptive pill, the synthetic progestin of the contraceptive pill, as well as natural hormones. Many of the drugs that we were making in AstraZeneca, you'd be looking at hundreds of tons every year. But to my knowledge, the entire quantity of the synthetic contraceptive pill that leads to this effect is equivalent of four bags of granulated sugar for the whole of the UK. So some of these medicines are incredibly potent. But this was a flagship study that came up uh, in the 1990s. What was important for human health, and this was actually kept classified for seven years, were monitoring all the drinking water reservoirs around London using fish because you couldn't measure the individual compounds in the water. They were well, well below the limits of analytical detection. But essentially, like the canary in the coal mine, the fish and other aquatic organisms were concentrating these chemicals. We could pick up an alert in terms of a health index, and then we could use that to decide how to treat that water, etc. And that goes on today. So there's basically a lot of work going on in rivers, lakes, etc., all around the UK and indeed all around Europe now, but linked on this approach. Then um, that Trojan horse, uh, as the Daily Mail put it, the fish being turned into freaks, really opened up more and more things because actually once the environmental scientists, chemists, hydrologists, biologists started looking, they found actually drug residues all over the place. Um, so BBC uh, headline in 2005 showed vast amounts of narcotics uh, in rivers. Um, and we decided as a company that even though legally we weren't required to do environmental assessment of these medicines, we should do. And that's something that's really informed my career very much. The idea that there is corporate responsibility. There are people in government who actually will look ahead uh, and along the lines that Jim's been talking about today. So really important. And this is the truth today. We think in a lot of um, lowland rivers, uh, in certain lakes, where there's um, uh, waste from people's homes particularly, we're going to see residues of medicines in the environment. And some of those will be antibiotics and related compounds, which I want to talk about. Not only um, is this an issue, just to sort of broaden it, um, there's a huge crash in the population of uh, predatory birds in parts of, Europe, parts of the world, particularly now in Spain, but it actually started in India. I don't know if you've heard about this, but this is veterinary medicines uh, being given to cattle, but because of the cultural approaches in, central, uh, uh, in the Indian subcontinent, if those animals die, vultures feed on the carcasses, and because of the um, uh, biology of these animals, they basically can't metabolize the drug and they die. This has meant that human cadavers can't be sent for air burial. It means that you have to chop down forests to burn human cadavers. It means that you get soil erosion, a whole cascade of health effects, all coming from the inappropriate use of one drug. So this isn't theory. This actually ap applies to what's happening in the environment. Now, to bring it back to the water and life theme, I just want to flag up this simple slide, and it's actually these two red boxes here. Although we're seeing a huge improvement in terms of water quality and health uh, in Europe, and particularly around the UK in the last 30, 40 years, we still see globally that actually it's bad news. It's a very high impact on freshwater systems, but also on coastal systems, and it's getting worse. So the global need 
for health scientists, environmental scientists, engineers, politicians, planners, to actually deal with the increasing impact of chemicals and pollution, including medicines, uh, on the environment, is actually growing. Uh, it's not going away. Uh, I didn't have a, because of time, I didn't put the slide on, but if you look at what's happening globally, humanity is moving to the coastlines. Uh, the majority of humanity now lives within about 40 kilometers of the sea. And where does the effluent go? Where is the treatment going? You see China emptying from the center in terms of population. The cities like Shenzhen, I was there four years ago, I think there were 25 million people there. 30 years ago, it was 10,000 people. And all of that infrastructure and all of our wastes and all of the hospitals have all got to be treated. Has he gone to sleep? Look into 2050, one of the timelines that uh, Jim mentioned earlier, and I'm going to come back to this one again. We're seeing huge impacts in terms of severe water quality. There's actually less water to dilute uh, the things that we discharge from our homes and from our factories. But linked to that, including medicines, the world production of chemicals is predicted to treble in the next um, 30 years, basically. So obviously we want chemicals in terms of medicines that we use reliably, that's what chemicals are. It's actually, we used to jokingly say in AstraZeneca, this was a, 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 an industry thought crime. Some of the same chemicals we use as medicines, we put on sugar beet and potatoes to protect them against fungi. They used to spray apple orchards with antibiotics like um, uh, oxytetracycline just to make the fruit blemish free to be more appropriate for supermarkets. So medicines or chemicals that are sometimes used as medicines, sometimes used as insecticides, sometimes used as antifoulant control in paints, on boats, are all part of that increase in chemosphere. So we've got more people, more chemicals, and less water. But the good news, and I, this is where I go back to it, this is all public domain, is actually what we're doing as a society in some cases about building environmental sustainability into the way that medicines are actually being produced and manufactured. So the key thing for this slide is this is actually a wastewater treatment plant um, at just near Bristol. Cost 90 million pounds to build. We had to build that factory for AstraZeneca's site for actually the manufacturing uh, treatment of new drugs for dealing with cardiovascular disease. The big problem is, economically, that investing in manufacturing and research facilities in Europe is so expensive compared to India and China. And the big problem I know, which isn't something I've studied myself, but actually a lot of the uh, cheap generic antibiotics have been produced in India in factories with no effluent treatment at all. And they're basically incubators of antimicrobial resistance because of lack of infrastructure, which is down to the di disparity of manufacturing costs in one region of the world to another. But that's an example of good practice. And all of this is publicly available on AstraZeneca's website. Um, but we were involved, if we take drugs like Arimidex, which is one of the new drugs for treating breast cancer, it actually has the same biological pathways of operating as those natural estrogens that were feminizing the fish in the rivers. And these are the kinds of things we were working on and still do. Finally, coming to a bit more um, brief um, on link on the science, we can actually, looking forward, not just for antibiotics, but for other uh, compounds, we can understand and predict what the environmental impacts will be because of these, four co these colour schemes. What we see from human beings through to small fish, through to uh, uh, nematodes, C. elegans, that again was a Nobel Prize winning project, and other organisms, we see conservation of drug targets. All those blue lines are enzymes that are targeted by medicines. Um, the, uh, if I take the yellow ones, they're transporter proteins that Prozac targets and all those drugs for treating that. So we can actually use now molecular biology in the field as well as in the uh, preclinical research areas to understand what organisms and therefore which ecosystems we would expect to see uh, impacts happening and then can monitor that in terms of surveillance. And it's much cheaper than doing traditional analytical chemistry. Coming to a close now, this is just one snapshot of some of the work that we're doing. This is working with Sean Comber in Environmental Sciences. Um, for some of you, um, I'll talk about the chemistry, but perhaps the thing that's most important is this image. We tend to think of these wonderful antimicrobial compounds as being used to treat key diseases. But actually, we put them into soap. We put them into toothpaste. Um, and there's a chemical called triclosan, uh, which is an antimicrobial compound which is of great concern in terms of its ubiquity of use. And I'll never forget um, about 10 years ago talking to a friend in GlaxoSmithKline saying they were going to remove it from their products as an act of stewardship, even though legally they're allowed to do it. It's a bit like the plastic microbeads that are in the shower gels. We don't know that they're there. We don't need them. 
but it became actually a cheaper way to actually manufacture and it's pulling out. So we can make decisions, not just in terms of whether we go to a doctor if we're feeling a bit down, whether we need to go and get antibiotics or, or do take other forms of uh, therapy or medication, but actually in what we buy and how we dispose of things. So the use of antimicrobials in personal care products and household um, detergents and things like that is a very, very big factor. And this westernized lifestyle of wanting to have, you know, the uh, designer kitchen and the, the um, perfect kitchen services, etc., all feeds into the wider use of that. We find triclosan, which is now a priority pollutant under the EU regulation, and hopefully that will carry through in terms of the post-Brexit environmental, environmental framework. We see it in the water, we see it in sediments, and we see it in organisms that the, they're the equivalent of the aquatic fruit fly that we see in the environment. But what we're trying to do, bearing in mind the economics of controlling these chemicals, is say what's actually available in the environment. And the work is looking at how natural chemicals, such as dissolved organic carbon from soils, and how the acidity affects the availability of that compound. I'll stop in a second, I've just got a couple of quick slides. The key thing about all of this, we can only go forward with um, societal development, economic benefit and the environment by factoring all of these things in together. And I know today there's a lot of very good programs from collaborative work with Plymouth and other universities with companies like AstraZeneca and GlaxoSmithKline. But finally, I'll just jump to this last slide. There actually is an environmental win-win um, by actually increasing awareness of this issue. Um, in Sweden, for example, all GPs give a booklet to patients about the environmental impact of medicines so that patients can actually say, no, actually, I don't need to take that, I won't take that. Unused medicines, not throwing them down the toilet, not throwing them into landfills, but actually taking them back to pharmacy for incineration is a huge part of the solution to this problem. And communicating with health care staff, with members of the public, with GPs and the scientists are all part of dealing with minimising the impact of medicines on the environment and specifically antimicrobials. So I'll stop there and thanks for your attention. <laughs>